just um, uh, regards to the project, remember, um, oh no, no, not, not really remember, but, um, but this week was a kind of weird week um, in that I really didn't get any new ones then, right? So I felt I'll mention that here because normally uh, coming up to exam, people try to get the project out of the way. But the ones I saw, uh, the people who sent projects were those who already had sent, um, you know, uh, so I, I didn't get any new ones. Normally if a new one come in, meaning that someone who didn't submit before, I put out ahead of the rest then because uh, some of those I would have seen, some of those that came in, I saw them twice already. So I would look at those probably on Monday, but if any new one comes in, I look at that first. But that's the thing though, I mean, from Monday to Friday, I, I, I looked, well, Friday morning, by Friday after lunch, I was doing something else, right? And there was no new one that came in um, from Monday to Friday around lunchtime. So just keep that to the back of your mind because remember you need to get them um, better then to see if you have any errors in them, right? So let me, Make a start. I, I'm not quite sure what's going on with Zoom, but you all seem to be hearing me okay. At least you all have not complained, right? So um, going straight into today's lesson, we have emergency procedures. I am going to stick to the slides to sort of finish it a bit. So this is a very short lesson. Um, in it, we have emergency procedures and we have a bit on um, first aid, right? So I know the camera is ticking, but if you can hear it, it's, it's quite good if you can just hear anyway. So emergency procedures here, um, again, I'll sort of do an explanation. There, there's a law for this, which by now we should be familiar with, the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations 1999. And I'll make it short for you. What it's simply saying, it's saying the employers must have emergency procedures. I think everyone knows that. Right, so again, I can't see these as exam questions, especially if you print these PowerPoints and you have them. Everyone should know that the law, I mean, even the OSHAC is saying a company must have an emergency procedure, right? And uh, you must, um, for example, you must have a procedure then for fire and chemical spill and stuff. So it is not really complicated here. So the law is saying you must, the employer must have an emergency procedure they must inform the persons who are possibly working around um, those areas then of the emergency procedures. And uh, if anyone has to be trained, for example, like a drill, but even if you have like a, um, like, like, like workers then to take part in the emergency procedures, like a first aider, a fire marshal, um, a warden, Right. Um, so if someone had like a role to play, that person had to be trained that the one that was using a fire watch or so-called fire watch or a fire marshal, right? The one that had to use the extinguisher. Um, and, it, and we're talking about fires here, but it, it could be chemical or whatever the emergency is that the workers who had a role to play then must be trained according to the procedure to fulfill their duties then. So it's not enough to have the procedure, but it, 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 is, it is sufficient though to have it and then to train people to do what they have to do then. Even if it was, I guess the simplest example is a first aider or the role caller, the person to call the role down at the master point, even so um, that person needs to be trained. Right, let me just try to get it to go on, right? So the same law again, um, the law is saying that uh, there are certain situations, if you just read this one here, certain emergencies then could be dealt with um, in-house. If you, if you look at the heading, it's contact with emergency services. But uh, if you have your first aiders, your first aiders are just able to administer, well, basic healthcare then, right? Um, the more serious injuries would have to be taken to um, the hospital, uh, if it's fire, the fire services would have to be contacted. If it's some sort of chemical spill, EME, and, you know, would have to be informed and stuff. So the law is saying, again, the management regs that there must be suitable arrangements there for contact with 
external services if something cannot be dealt with in-house, which is often the case. So you have your first aiders, but then most of you will know this already that the company will have the contact numbers for fire, police, the ODPM, OSHA, EMA, etc. right? The closest fire station, if I didn't see that one already, right? So they are saying that there must be arrangements in place to deal with um, these, I guess, major disasters that cannot be dealt with in-house, right? So um, I'll just stick to this slide now. If an emergency is foreseeable, then it is foreseeable that you can do something about it as well as minimize its consequences should it occur. An emergency plan should be produced so that an organization is as best prepared so far as is reasonably practicable should one occur. The plan should address emergency response during every phase of the emergency. And they have the main stages of an emergency plan is there. Um, assessment, prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. Again, it's not nothing to cram, um, but if you have this printed, you may want to kind of highlight that, that those are the major stages in an emergency plan. You first of all assess like what emergency the company is um, going to be affected by. So, I mean, just, just not to over talk this, but if you are living in a, if your company, sorry, my mistake there, if, if your company is in a flood prone area, then you may want to come up with an emergency plan for flooding. Just let me admit um, two persons there. Yeah, so you would want to come up with, with, with a plan for whatever your company is, like whatever the task and the activities would be, then you seek to prevent it. Uh, I, I suppose if it is fire, you would seek to, you know, minimize sources of ignition, fuel, etc. right? You have your preparedness sorted out, like what would they do in the event of a fire? You have the response, maybe the, the response would be sort of like the drills and the process of contacting the fire services and then how would the company recover, right? Um, so again, um, these things are going to be forward to tell students to learn them, but you will have them on this slide, the main stages of an emergency plan, right? The degree of planning should be proportional to the probability of a major accident hazard occurring. What does that mean? It means the more serious the accident, the more detailed the plan, right? So the more serious the accident, the more detailed your plan should be. So if you are in general company, um, your fire and emergency plan then could just be simple things as extinguishers, getting the workers out to the muster point, and um, maybe, of course not maybe, but um, contacting the fire services, right? But if you are a process plant, if you are a plant like, you know, one of the plants at the um, Point Lisa's industrial estate, because of the risk of fire, then it's gonna be way much more robust than just a couple of office fire extinguishers and, you know, relying on the fire services. I'm sure you all know that a lot of companies, they have, um, they, they have their own fire services. In fact, Atlantic LNG have their own, um, you know, fire uh, trucks and whatever have you. So that's how detailed a plan could go to tell you that the, the degree of planning should reflect the probability, right, and the proportion of the major accident happening, right? Um, you would need plans for part of the sites or different parts of the sites, for example, danger areas and one for the overall site, right? So that latter part there could have just been um, information. Right, emergency plan components, how would they work? So um, they will need to sort out when and how to call the emergency services. And the answer for that really is when they would have assessed what is happening to be more than what they can deal with, right? So maybe it's a large fire or a large chemical spill and their um, spill kits. You do have companies like uh, um, environmental companies then, right? That come in and that can take care of your spill right, um, eco-sol, 
um, if I can call some by name, and be environmental and stuff. And you all may know more than me anyway, Oil Mop. Oil Mop is one of those companies. So if it was like a huge spill from a tank, uh, I'm just saying here that the company would have already sourced someone like Oil Mop or NB Environmental to come in, right? So when they see it's a large spill or maybe someone reports that a tank is overflowing, they will know, of course, the call in their um, contractor there, right? Who will take charge and what will they be responsible for? Uh, normally that person is called an incident commander, right? Um, that can be a safety. Again, if you are sufficiently trained, if not, you can leave it to the um, contractor company per se then, right? But who is to take charge is not automatically the safety. It's someone who has experience in dealing with emergencies, right? You notice that, um, when I say that, of, of, of course, is that you all can be placed as a safety after this course, right? But that doesn't mean you have the experience in dealing with an emergency if you have someone who did that before at another company, right? Um, in your company, that is, maybe you have a, a engineer or something who, you know, served as an incident commander in a previous company, fine, put them, right? Don't, don't put yourself because um, those things are highly stressful when you have to deal with uh, the media and you have to deal with the EMA and residents and stuff, right? So, you know, normally you have people in your companies who can't do that and you can uh, put them. Let me just again add some people. Again, see if you have any questions. Right. Um, but again, I mean, for those I'm seeing some of y'all, I mean, y'all hear me okay. I am seeing a couple of delays, like I said. I could, so, so could you just nod? I mean, or could you just come in? And, so y'all hear me okay. Okay, good. Right. But I am seeing a bit of delays. Okay. Thanks very much um, for the acknowledgement. Right. Um, but if you all see it's coming through, okay, fine. Right, okay, so I'm, I'm moving on then. Um, so procedures for response, including special circumstances. Um, let me just tell you these things. The special circumstances they are talking about is if someone is absent. So this is gonna clear that up there, right? So the procedures for response, including special circumstances, circumstances, sorry. Special circumstances, again, is like, you know, so what would happen then if um, the incident commander, um, I'm assuming this is now an engineer in your company, is on annual vacation, right? Or what if, I mean, simpler than that, what if the first aiders and the fire marshals are not there? What if they have a DO for something, right? So they, they have to you have to consider that, right? So like, what would happen if, um, if uh, an emergency does happen, like out of hours, or it happens on a weekend, all of those are what we call special circumstances. What happens on the weekend? What happens after four or five o'clock? What happens if the people to take charge is they are rightfully on their um, vacation or time off then, right? Or days that they are entitled to, right? So availability of resources, including the requirement of any specialist equipment. So you do have to consider that. Um, again, this may come in a lot for things like spills. Um, I suppose it may include fire extinguishers if a company doesn't have extinguishers, but really extinguishers are kind of like a basic requirement. So special equipment may be things like, uh, if it was an oil spill, things like pumps and um, Bonds, B U N D S, which is like a containment area. Um, things like certain chemicals that would actually dissolve the oil, right? You do have a couple of eco friendly chemicals that can do that. You also have some not so eco friendly chemicals that can do that. And that could actually, um, I, I know um, some companies do that, right? That was, of course, reported a lot to the news, even in Trinidad here, where we had the oil spill right, in Point Fortin and Coffee Beach and stuff, and some of the regions they use simply sank the oil to the bottom of the um, rivers and streams and ocean and stuff, but it didn't get rid of it, right? The fishermen kept reporting that the oil was still there. So um, some chemicals do that and some companies do that. Remember, oil floats on water, so um, 
for some people, if it's just out of your eye, you think it's gone, but uh, you really want the chemicals there. So that may be specialist equipment and reagents and stuff like that, right? Um, where and how to get information, how emergency responders will be identified and how each can identify each other. Well, I'll wrap that up in a bit. That is kind of tied into the last one. Where emergency responders will rendezvous, that when there is rendezvous and how they will communicate. So typically the emergency responders, if you are using, um, but I mean, even if you're using contractors, I mean, they will have high, vis high visibility vests on, right? They'll have on a high visibility vest, even if it's your employees, you're probably gonna have to buy that for them. Um, so that's really how they will be identified for, again, for the bigger companies that use, um, you know, I mean, a lot of contractors with Atlantic then, right, Hummingbird and stuff, they, they serve as rescue teams then. So it's almost as if the company will know, okay, that if there's an emergency, the rescue team is going to come from Hummingbird, which is HSSL. So the HSSL workers may have on a particular coverall that's different from the normal Atlantic workers, right? So you can sort that out how they will be identified. But some cases it's easy. And even if it's your employees, um, you normally buy a high visibility. These things are not expensive. Roughly high visibility vest, you can get one for about $30. Maybe less now. A lot of people are selling all these things pretty cheap now, right? So um, so how they be identified? Where would they rendezvous? Um, so rendezvous mean where would they meet? And there's a need for them meeting. Let me just break this down a bit. Hopefully I don't overdo it here, but um, if there is an emergency then, right? Like um, a fire or a spill or terrorism, whatever have you. Um, once everyone has been, the first response is to evacuate everybody, right? So when the alarm goes off or somebody shouts fire, the team will go and evacuate everybody or the employees themselves, if it's based on that system you have, the employees will or should get up calmly and quietly and proceed to the muster point, right? But the team will need to meet, right? Especially if it's things like a spill or maybe even like fire. So what some companies have done, they have like, um, to tell you how serious it can be, well, sometimes they can meet um, in a container. They have like specially designed what we in Trinidad call dog houses, which is like a container. So that container then becomes like a base of operation. If your building is on fire or there's a chemical spill in the factory, then you cannot go back into the building. So they have to sort those things out, like where would they meet, right? Where would they rendezvous? And they will normally communicate via, of course, walkie talkies and maybe cell phones if it's not a gas release. If it's a gas release, it would be advised not to use the cell phones, right? If um, I mean, and, and these are not things to really remember, but if you all have seen on uh, cable news anyway, and uh, I mean, one happened around Christmas, there was like a bombing, um, but it was domestic though, meaning it was not external terrorism. And of course, I think we also what happened to Washington or in Washington DC, right? But if, if you all look at that with another view, like with a safety view, what you would see is that sometimes the place of rendezvousing is right in the road. Like the fire trucks or the police cars will come and they will just make a block then. They will physically try to block off the area, right? And they would rendezvous then, right? If it's a fire, especially like right in the road itself, right? Will be like their place of meeting then. I'm saying though that that is like a general, um, state emergencies, but for a company, a company can fairly well sort of that we will rendezvous. Um, maybe they have another branch, maybe they'll rendezvous there, or maybe they would uh, actually have a sort of container type, you know, dog house. Um, a lot of people use it for offices anyway, so if it could move, they can move it, and they can, uh, most dog houses you can, or containers, you can hook it up right, to a truck or something and get it out of the way if it was a fire, and then you can use that as your base of operations then. But that's how complicated this can be, and I'm sure that Nemo is not going to test any of this. I'm just trying to make it more 
practical, right? So emergency plan, making it work. Um, there's only one way to make an emergency plan work, and that is by training and doing drills, right? So if you read to all of this, everyone who has a part to play, to play in the drill, uh, meaning the first aiders, the fire marshals, the safety, the people down at the muster point, the roll callers, right? They all have to be trained. I mean, this could be done with in-house training, especially for the positions like um, roll callers and fire marshals, but uh, there may be some, like the person to call the emergency services. That's just the receptionist. A lot of these training would be done in-house, but after the training, you need to do a drill, right? And so, um, in terms of the plan too, you need to consider people who are differently able. So this is obvious here. I will simplify all of that by telling you, you need to consider the disabled as well as anybody else who may have, um, or who may require special assistance, right? Like uh, a pregnant woman, uh, an elderly worker, somebody who may have um, an injury. The injury may not be classed as a disability, but that person would need to be like your plan there, this is the point, the plan, the procedure must consider um, people who are differently able, the folks on the wheelchair, if you have any, uh, it needs to consider um, pregnant employees, right? And if you're wondering what this is here, that personal plan, the part of the evacuation plan that focuses on the person on the wheelchair there, on the person that may be on a crutch, right? Crutches then that aspect of the plan is what is referred to as a PEEP, a personal emergency evacuation plan, right? So the, the point here is that the emergency plan should consider everyday employees, but it should consider um, folks who may be, or who require special assistance then, right? So um, this one say fire instruction notices should be conspicuous, meaning it should be clear um, let me just break this down for you. I mean, we, we all have seen fire extinguishers and normally what this is saying is that there must be, you know, me say like a red arrow sticker uh, pointing downwards towards the extinguisher. So this is what it's saying that the fire extinguisher should be, it should be highlighted and, and that's why you have like a, a, a sign saying fire extinguisher. So it's saying that that should be clear, conspicuous means clear. It should be next to the fire extinguisher. It should state the fire action to take on hearing the alarm. Um, so some of you may be familiar with the acronym um, PASS. Uh, PASS is, the P is a pull the pin from the extinguisher. The A is to aim the nozzle at the base of the fire. The first S is to squeeze the, well, the expelling mechanism, which is like the lever on the extinguisher. And the other S is, um, you know, sweep from side to side, right? At the base of the fire. So normally those signs are, are next to the fire extinguisher anyway. And what, of course, we are saying to the end, it should actually um, encourage all persons to evacuate. Um, so everybody should not tackle the fire. Um, if you are not trained to do so, right? So it's only the fire marshals or the fire wardens that would have been trained. If you are the normal employee and you did not volunteer, nor were you nominated to be part of the emergency evacuation team, these are some things that um, some of these positions in the companies are not paid. Like you don't get extra pay for being a first aider, but you may get some benefits like um, you know, the company may pay for you to do a first aid course. Um, likewise, if you want to serve as a fire marshal, you may not be paid additional for that, but you could be sponsored on a fire watch course or a fire marshal course. So um, I'm saying that um, if you did not volunteer or they volunteered you and you said no, in the event of a real emergency, you, you, you should have nothing to do. Your business then is to how they say in the companies, I'll say it how they say it, right? They say, get out and stay out, right? If you did not volunteer to be in any part of the plan. So this is a general idea in the, in the case of a fire, someone would have raised the alarm by breaking the nearest 
break glass system if you have that. If not, the alarm may have been sounded or some employee may just have been shouting fire to the top of their voice, right? So someone in the plan would have used the telephone to call the emergency services. That is typically the receptionist. What you have to know is that you, you cannot do all of this. You, um, the safety then, the safety then cannot fulfill all the rules in the plan, right? The safety cannot break the glass, call the emergency services, run out and get everybody out of the building, run down to the muster point, check if everybody is there, run back, use the extinguisher. The safety cannot do all of that. So that's why everybody has something to do in the plan then. So the receptionist may call the fire services. They will give their name and all that you're looking at here. Whoever is a fire marshal would probably use the extinguisher on the fire, right? The safety may be um, there or the safety may have made their way down to the muster point to see if everybody is okay, right? So this is like the answer on the other slide, identify types of emergency plans that exist in an organization. I wish I could have you all come in, but it's gonna take me some time, so I would not have you come in. Um, I wanna try to push the work there, and especially when it's on this slide already, right? But I said, this is what is different with Zoom and face-to-face -face. normally. We would have um, uh, elicit this from you all then, right? So types of emergency plans that a company can have, um, gas explosion, emergency plans, electric burns or electrocution, escape of toxic gases or fumes, terrorist threat, spread of highly infectious diseases as you know what we're going to know, severe weather, aircraft crash if near buildings. And of course, uh, this was my attempt to give you some that are not the ordinary ones then, right? So of course, if you want to go back with fire and flooding and natural disasters, fine. But I already try to give some here that um, could, could add to what you already know, right? Um, I'd, I'd have more, by the way, but I don't think you'll ever be asked more. Um, you also have transport accidents. If I put my mind, I could come up with about Titi, right? But um, transport accidents, um, as, a, as a on this too, just to kind of give a little throw back to the OBE exam. Remember, um, for the OBE exam, you can use the internet, right? Uh, there's no restriction on using Google. So if you see a question as what, what are 10 emergency plans, I'm just making that up by the way, and you come up with your best, you come up with fire, flooding, you know, natural disasters, um, chemical spill, that's about four there, and maybe flooding, fine, fine, you can take some from me. But if you did not print my notes, so you, I mean, remember I told you, you probably need to print it because you don't want to be minimizing your template then, the screen that the exam is on, that internet thing, and then having to open these PowerPoints, especially if the internet may be slow, like, like what's happening this morning here. But um, you need to really have these PowerPoints. So, but if you do it, what I'm saying is that it is as simple as, um, as using your textbook. Uh, JC2 may have some of this, to be honest with you. So your textbook may be your first option. Or your notes, sorry, would be your first option, second to be the textbook. But I know for some people, Google, Google is the first option, right? So not, I mean, not to, not to fool you, for a lot of people, Google is their first option as opposed to the notes. But at least I said, at least the good thing with my students is that a lot of them say that, that, that they use the notes then, right? Um, of course, they do say Google as well, but to tell you the notes are also important, right? So dealing with the media, I'll break it down. Or I can probably just read it, it'll be simpler. So only designated person should deal with the media during an emergency. Person should be trained to handle external relations. Um, well, some companies actually have a person like that, right? The person, some of you may know, is called a communication specialist. That is actually a position. You have to have a degree. For better companies, you have to have a master's degree to serve as a communication specialist. All the big companies have one. Heritage have one. Atlantic have one. You, you get the idea, right? All the big companies have one. The airport have one, right? If there's anything, up, I, I'm sure this 
well, I wouldn't call it personal name here, but if there's anything when the airport and stuff, you know, we find that um, the communication department will put out a release then, right? So this is the idea. And just to tell you why that is important, you don't want anybody, you know, like giving out um, information to the media before any investigation is done. So typically what is released is like a political statement, for want of a better example here. It is um, something that says that, you know, we are you know, uh, Damas Oil, we will be investigating and upon such time, the findings will be released to the relevant authority. In short, to get a response, but they didn't really get what happened at all, right? So uh, there are many examples of that. If you all are familiar with uh, companies and even in the, in the news I'm talking about, even if there is a debt in some companies, you typically will get a technical answer then or a political answer coming out of the communication specialist and what they say is that the media never comes back. Like if something happened to your company, they will come, but they don't really come back then from today to tomorrow. The news then would cover just the hottest item of the day, right? So if you had an accident in your company today, they probably wouldn't come back. If it's maybe a spill and it's affecting fishermen and stuff, they probably will come back for a couple of days, but then they don't always come back. So sometimes you still see the investigation is pending by the EME and OSHA and stuff, right? So you get the idea that no one is releasing sensitive information out to the media, right? So first aid, we almost finished with this one. First aid, um, there's a law for first aid. It's called the First Aid Regulations 1981. Again, remember these are the laws in the UK and you don't have to remember them anymore. So to summarize from before, we basically saw that there's a law saying you must have an emergency procedure. The law was the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations 1999. Not as if they will ask you that. So this is a law that still saying you must have first aid provisions in place. Or you must have trained people to carry out first aid and that you must give information on who the first aiders are and the first aid provision to the employees. So you must have seen this, so you must be aware in some companies that um, they will have like a list of first aiders, right? So if you're in a big company um, in your department, if there's 20 persons or 15, it's a kind of good number, they will actually have like one first aider. So they will say that like Jerry is the first aider for this department and you know, the first aid kit at this location is located, you know, probably by the manager or something, right? Or out in the hallway, right? So the law actually requires that. Um, what is the function of first aid? This, if you are doing a first aid course, this is exactly what they teach you. The function of first aid is that it preserves life. They call it the three Ps, by the way. They, it prevents further injury and it promotes recovery. Again, the beauty about the open book exam is no need to cram those things. Um, this slide is talking about, you will know what equipment and facilities to put for your first aid provision based on the risk that your company is facing. So they are saying here, what equipment, like in other words then, I mean, if I can break it down really simple, like, like what do you put in your first aid kit, right? Do you put, um, do you put, well, there is actually a minimum requirement in first aid kits, right? But, um, which is like the number of bandages and plasters and whatever you get, right? But I'm saying is that it's based on the risk that your company is at, you will know how best to stock the kit then, right? Um, especially if your closest medical center is far away, if the closest medical center is far from the company, you need to have a lot of stuff in your first aid provisions. I wouldn't say kit because it could be more stuff that could not fit in a typical kit, right? So um, you need to have an appointed person to take charge of first aid arrangements and you need to give information to the employees about these arrangements. So again, the law, this, this, this second law here, the one you see on top here, the Health and Safety Miscellaneous Amendment Regulation 2002. What this is saying is that you must have proper signs for your first aid kit and your first aid room or your first aid location, right? You'll see here, first aid rooms to comply with the 
Safety Sign and Signal Regulations 1996. And um, uh, some of the signs is coming up, right? If I go down a bit, you'll see, but let me just read what you have here. This question here came from OBE exam. What factors determine the type of first aid provisions in the workplace? It's almost the same thing I just said, like, how do you know what to put in your kit? The answer would have been what you come up with with the risk assessment, right? What factors determine the, the type of first aid provisions in a, in a workplace? If you want, I could shout four for you. You already said it's a risk assessment. If you remember what a risk assessment is, you could break up what a risk assessment is and come up with four or five. I can probably give you about five. I will not pull the marker because um, already the system is running a bit slow. Right, so the first answer you want here is, um, for example, like what task is the company doing? I can't give you what I, what I know for sure, right? But I don't know if my examples would be things that you all could relate to now, right? Currently, right now, Heritage is talking in their first aid kit things like um, antidotes for snake bite. The reason is that um, as Heritage took over there from Petrotrin, for if anybody who lives in the deep south or maybe wherever you have uh, producing wells then or oil wells, you would have realized it's a bit of a deplorable conditions at the moment. So one of the things Heritage is doing is getting um, contractors, right? Which I think is actually Ken Sons. One of their main contractors is Ken Sons, right? To do a lot of um, inspection of the lines and the wells and stuff. But these have been more or less overgrown with, with, with bushes then and shrubs. So one of the things the uh, contractors are reporting is a lot of snakes. So for their emergency provision, they have to put, you know, like antidote and stuff for snake bites, right? And even from insects, right? I guess even wasp and what we call Japan stuff in Trinidad, right? So um, so the first thing, I mean, just to say to them fast, I wouldn't explain all of them. I give you a little scenario there so you can have an idea of what I'm talking about. So you wanna consider the task that is being done. You wanna consider the hazards. You wanna consider the risk. I told you if you break up the risk assessment, you'll get some answers there, right? You probably want to consider maybe like the type of person that's doing the job. Meaning like if it's uh, somebody who have allergies or someone who have a medical condition, right? Someone who maybe have a allergy to insect or whatever have you, right? You need to have more provisions for them. And the last one, we already said it, which was how far away are they from a medical center? because the further you are away from a hospital then, and even if I would say a medical center too, but there are some medical centers I know that do not work after 12 o'clock, right? So it may have a medical center in some parts of Trinidad, right? Um, but they may not have any doctors or nurses. This is the government I'm talking about. There's no doctors and nurses there after lunch, right? Um, so. I don't want to call those names out loud anyway, but more or less in the more rural parts of Trinidad anyway, you'll find those things happen, right? But so the, the further you are away from the medical center, the more things you have to put in your medical kit, right? So just to go again a bit fast here, um, the lawyer is saying suitable persons need to be trained. So that will be the first aiders. The lawyer is requiring the company to appoint first aiders. They must receive training. In England, though, they mention here, the first aider must have an HSC approved first aid qualification. They must receive the appropriate additional training in relation to any special hazards likely to be exposed to. Like if a typical first aid course then did not consider the snake bites, right? Or anything like that then, right? Um, even if the person is required to use specialist equipment, which could be like the AED, which stands for automated external defibrillators. Most first aid courses will cover that, but I'm just saying if it doesn't, um, they may need to know how to use the AED, et cetera, right? So a first aid course is a good course to do after you are finished with this thing here. Um, we have one, 
from the UK, right? From the Emergency Care and Safety Institute. Um, but of course, please focus on your examples and don't bother with that until somewhere in February, right? So factors influencing the number of suitable persons. So how do you know how much first aiders to use? They have a little rule here. So it's like one for every 50. So one first aider, this is an ACOP, which for those who remember, it's kind of like a guidance. So one first aider would be sufficient, kind of. I say kind of because remember, you kind of have to base that on the risk, right? So like the location, right? You kind of have to base that on the risk. So like the higher the risk then, I guess if you were just in the office then, I mean, two first aiders is nothing to get two persons trained, but it's like a little, um, you know, rule here from the ACOP, it says it recommends at least one person. Well, the word at least means more than one, but one minimum, right? So you could get away with one, but most companies are having two first aiders because you do have to consider what happens if one is on holiday or if one is on, well, you know, some sort of medical leave per se, right? So simply put, a lot of those things you all know already about first aid. This other side is saying that if the first aider is absent, the law, sorry, not the law, the company should have an appointed person. Appointed person, just to make it simple for you, is someone who could serve as a first aider, but they may not be suitably trained as a first aider. I will say that again, or maybe say it differently. Um, the appointed person then is like a fill-in person, but this appointed person does not have to fully be trained as a first aider. Right? The person is just appointed in case the first aiders are absent. He or she can do these responsibilities. Yeah, they can call the emergency service. They can administer first aid. They would be responsible for the equipment. Um, they may be able to use the equipment if what they are responsible for. For in short, it means the person is trained, but may be trained at a basic first aid level, but they have not done the advanced training then to what the actual first aider may have done. So just like a backup person, the, the law is calling them an appointed person. So to simplify this, the first aid regulations 1981 requires aiders, you saw that on this slide here. The suitable ones, when you read it over, you'll see, if I go back one again, you'll see the suitable persons were the first aiders. So the law require first aiders, but it also require backup people to help in the event that the first aiders are not available, right? Those backup persons are what we call appointed persons. They may have some sort of basic first aid training, but they are in no way then the full first aider and they don't have to be that qualified to be an appointed person, right? So companies can sort that out. First aid arrangements, the employer must inform his employees about the first aid arrangements. Um, I just saw something. Hopefully, I didn't uh, ignore anybody on the on the group, right? Um, yeah. So the, the the company must inform. This is obvious. Like, where is the first aid equipment? What facilities they have? Who are the first aid tra um, trained persons? The common practice involves putting that in the company policy, and probably putting it up on the notice board. At least one notice informing the employees of the names, location and uh, of the first aiders and perhaps even where is if you have like a sick bay or maybe um, there is no sick bay but they say in the event of someone becoming ill um, they can use and for big companies they have different meeting rooms right so they can use meeting room two or meeting room 2b so you inform them then that if someone was not well, the first aiders can see you in room 2A, right? If you don't have a designated um, sick bay, right? These are the signs I mentioned to you all before. Um, if I can get this slide to go. It's a bit uh, delayed on my side, right? But the signs you're gonna be seeing is the, the, the thing about the signs, it's saying that the first aid room must, must just be appropriate these signs. If you have your PowerPoint, you'll see it, right? Um, you don't have to learn these signs. It's just saying the first aid rooms must be appropriately signed. It must, it was, it would also say things like the fire extinguishers that we spoke about before. 
must have their sign on, you know, the instructions passed and stuff on it. So what are safety signs? Safety signs give you a message about health and safety. Each sign have, it may have a different geometric form. They have different colors and symbols and text and words and stuff on them, right? Um, so signs, of course, should be used whenever you have the risk that you cannot eliminate to the end. So these are your typical safety signs. I would suggest um, if you do not know them, neighbors don't really test this. All, all this is saying that the first aid room must have a proper sign. And um, if it was a fire extinguisher, the, the route you were going to go out through must be appropriately signed. But for yourself, if you don't know the proper sign and you know, shape and stuff, you could learn it. Prohibition signs are basically um, a white background, black pictogram. And there's like a, a red diagonal line, um, you know, uh, saying not to do something. So the most common one that you all may have seen is like no smoking. The no smoking sign is a prohibition sign. The next time you drive up to the gas station, you can look and you can see mandatory signs, uh, blue background, white pictogram, detailing a must do action. So like hard hats must be worn. Uh, goggles must be worn. Those are going to be blue and white. We all know the warning signs, yellow and black, typically triangular, but any shape would actually do once it's yellow and black. Emergency signs, and this is what we are seeing, like the first aid signs and stuff should have a green background, white pictogram, right? So if you are in the, if you are a safety, I know some of you all are safeties or you will be safety, and you're going to order these signs, just make sure that you check with the supplier for the colors, right? I want some, I want one more than once, right? I just mightn't want to share the other one here because um, I have students here who could remember or who are in the company that I'm talking about, right? So I wouldn't share one of them, but I, 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 I remember one, one company I went to, they had all the signs um, and one of my students was actually there, right? Uh, they had all the signs mixed up right like uh mandatory was yellow and black and prohibition was blue right um but it was a new safety person then it was like a young safety we had gotten a job for and it wasn't in fact if i can just tell you so that the person who may think i'm talking about them you know it's not you i'm talking about right um it was actually in the mall but it wasn't san fernando mall it was um it wasn't gov city then it was um Center Point Mall, right? Center Point Mall in Shagwanas. I had a student there, well, two in fact, because after that one, they took another one of my students. Oh, after that one left, sorry, right? Not that they had lost their job or not, neither, but they took another one. And But the first one, the signs are all mixed up because apparently the person ordered it, but probably didn't check with the supplier that, you know, it was all wrong anyway then, right? So they had to go and get it done over again. So just make sure for yourself, when you get in as a safety or if you're serving in that function, just make sure that if um, you look at your signs that they are the correct um, colors per se, right? Um, occasional signs, this may be the shouting of the voice, um, they are saying or, this, or the, um, the emergency alarm. They simply put it must be above background noise, right? You'll see that it must be above background noise. So all acoustic signals, even if it was your voice, should be set so that it can be heard above the background noise level. Neither be painful or, well, excessive or painful. The song must be recognizable. So when the employees hear, they will know, okay, that's a fire. If you have different songs, and a lot of companies have different songs of the different emergencies. So uh, it may just be a couple of beeps, you know, like one beep is fire, maybe two beeps and a louder beep to the end, there may be chemical spell, right? So fire alarm should be clearly audible distinguishable from other acoustic signals, easily heard everywhere on site. And that is the end of this one. So share with me any questions you have. The, the one question I have um, here would have been in the OBE then, uh, well, maybe two questions, but one was on this slide already, which was to identify the emergency situations a company may want to have a procedure for. The laws and stuff, you don't have to worry to, you know, cram first aid regs 1981 or 
management regs 1999 or safety sign and signal regulation don't don't do that because it's an open book exam you could often just go back and look at the law and even look at what the law is saying i mean quite frankly the law is saying everything that you all already know even if it's emergency right that you must come up with an emergency procedure I said two there because even if it's first aid, the Lord is the Lord is saying, you know, come up, make sure you have your first aiders, make sure they are trained, make sure you inform employees about who the first aiders are and uh, where the rooms and stuff are located. These are what is commonly practiced in the company. Anyway, so that, that was the first thing I was saying. The the other question that did come from OBE was the one about first aid provisions. What will dictate or what will determine what factors, sorry, that kind of is the same thing, right? So what factors will determine, you know, like what you put in the first aid kit then, right? Or your first aid provisions. And the answer is, is we said about five, the task the company is doing. I mean, if it's an office type company, then they're not doing much like, you know, like heritage and walking these oil lines in the bush. You know, it's way different anyway. So the, the, the task you're doing with, with lean to the hazard, the risk, um, the workers who are doing the task, are they medically fit, right? Do they have any allergies? Um, also, how far away you are from a, um, a nearby hospital, right? And um, I would probably share a, a hint with you all. I don't know if I shared a hint. I, I have said it already, but I didn't really sh show you all that. Google is a good way of getting answers, right? If you simply, um, if you simply, but I'd have to come up the recording to show you that, right? Which I may not get time to do today. Just know that Google is a good source of information. If you were just a type that in Google, what factors to consider in deciding on first aid provisions? I don't know if you know this, but Google will actually direct you back to the guidance, the HSG guidance, and which is good information. Right, so ensure that it would not steer you in the wrong direction. And if you had to get 10 answers for that, you can look for it in your book. By the way, these things are in your book in um, chapter three, right? I just didn't get a chance to open the book today. All of these are in your book. Please look for it. I mean, I did see it. If you want, I can do it now, but it's going to cost me some time. That same thing I mentioned, the factors to determine first aid provision is straight from your textbook. Right, um, I'm trying to talk and see if we could find it, right? And, and doing that, I, try, I want to try to switch this slide. I'm going to go into the next lesson. But um, know that these things that I mentioned to you all, first aid provisions is on, let me just check my light in here. First aid provision is on page 63. Sorry, emergency procedures is, is on page 63. First aid, right, uh, 65. Did that same thing I mentioned to you all, it's on page 67, see if you see it. In, in, in fact, write it down, right? Next thing you think I was, I was making a joke when I told you that your book is your first source of information. Watch page 67 of chapter three. And while you're doing that, I am changing the PowerPoint in the back, right? Um, to lesson 12. In case you came in a little bit late and you wonder, well, what happened to 10? And what happened to 11? Well, you should have just checked the head and on the one we just said, it says nine to 10. So by covering nine, you also cover 10. And what happened to 11? There was no 11. 11 was meant for a mock exam, right? Normally on the 11 session, we will give the students, when the exam was, was memory-based then, we'll give the students an exam on the 11 session. It was reserved for a mock exam. So there is no 11 session. So we are on lesson 12. Did you all see it? Um, I'm looking, I have my light and how it's set here. Um, I put the light more on the computer screen. So the book is like in front of me, right? So did you all see page 67 there? Factors to consider when deciding first aid, just at the top of it, right? Um, deciding three of 67, deciding first aid provisions and number of first aiders. So you didn't even have to go to Google. Right, it is called an open book exam for a reason, right? You have to open your book. So the general, look at the answers you have. The same thing I said, the general risk level, the hazard, accident history, presence of vulnerable people, those who had the allergies and whatever. So, and then they have 10 answers there, right? 
Oh, so if you're listening, I, I know, and, and of course I know that you're listening, I am saved. If you all did not open your book and you had typed that into Google, the factors to consider when deciding for is it provision, I have done it. So that's what I'm telling you, I know what I'm telling you. Google will direct you to that same information on an HSG guidance, right? If you watch page 67, they actually reference those documents there. You know? If you watch page 67, just under the word more, if you watch under the word more, you're gonna see some websites. Um, a leaflet, INDG 347, that's a guidance. When, when you type that question on Google, Google sends you back to the same guidance. So the bottom line is uh, Google or your textbook should point you in the right direction. Plus you also have today's class notes. So there's no way that you should be um, not passing questions like these. I, did, I don't even mention to you all too, I know I'm wasting time here now because can I come up the lesson, right? And um, the last exam we had, we had quite a lot of students passing. I think I mentioned that to you, and I'm not quite sure, about 80%. Um, there were three students who were referred, but um, I, I think they misinterpreted the question, right? So one of the things you have to do when you get the question, if it's straightforward, it is fine, but think about what the question is asking, right? Um, but there were some students who got some really high marks, right? Uh, 60s and 70s and stuff. So I am expecting high from, from you all because uh, what, what makes this class different, this is one of my favorite classes. And I would often tell Janet that, I mean, I'd of course, tell you all that. But we'd always remember you all because um, I remember what makes you all different is that a lot of you all have a degree already. I had one class like this about 10 years ago. Um, I had purposely done it. In fact, I had purposely only book degree students and we got like uh, almost like a hundred percent. Of course, it was written exams. It was harder back then, but we got one of the highest pass rates in the world then um, by taking just degree students, right? The next class we have, when you all leave us um, the first Saturday in February, we have another 25 students waiting to start, but they are different from you all in that almost the opposite, none of them have a degree already, right? So we normally find the degree students do better. You all are better to analyze and interpret stuff, right? So that's what I said, I'm expecting good from you all because I did have, and I remember that class, I remember that class 10 years ago. I mean, classes come and go and I do remember them, but I remember that one with the degree. And likewise for you all, I remember you all because you all are almost the same as that, um, a bunch of students we had about 10 years ago, right? Anyway, hopefully you saw that. Um, if you have your PowerPoints, you can probably make the change. I've opened session 12 here, but we're gonna get into this one. Of course, we wouldn't finish, but we'd of course put uh, maybe a little 10 minutes into this lesson anyway, right? So, um, right, so what you need to know is that this now is chapter four. So if you turn the pages there out of first aid, I mean, we were on page 67. Oh, I mean, all of this has taken me time, right? If you turn the page, you're gonna see summary and you'll see, of course, chapter three is finished and we are on the last chapter now, chapter four. The heading is the same on this slide. If I can just move mine a bit, you're gonna see the heading is the same, which is um, active and reactive monitoring, right? So let's go straight into this, the last chapter, very short, uh, we'll finish this in time, um, well, not, not as long as chapter one then, right? We finish this in time with the next, um, I think three weeks we have anyway, right? So active and reactive monitoring. Um, let me just get a good content piece of it here. So um, let me just, of course, try to break it down for you all in the simplest way for anyone who is not in safety here. So we're on page three of page four, right? Just in case you see me looking and Turn in. And even page 404 and stuff could be good stuff as well for today. So um, active and reactive monitoring, if you have no idea what this is, this is um, the company, right? What they do, they keep a record of what's happening for the month. And then of course, that would eventually be the record for the year then, right? Because the 12 months in the year. So what they do, they record all the positive things. If we can go back to the heading, my mistake there. They record all the positive things that happens for the month. 
and the positive things are called, well, in the UK, it's called active monitoring. So you may wonder like, what is positive then? Like, like if you did inspections, like maybe 30 inspections, I mean, this kind of like is a big, I'm saying that for a big company, a big company will do more than 30 inspections a month. Why 30? Because there's 30, well, roughly 30 days in a month. So every day you should have done at least one inspection then, right? So the things they do that is positive, they record it. Um, training is also positive. So like if you had somebody trained, not yourself though, I mean, if you're paying for yourself, that's different. But if the company would have paid for you to do first aid and um, anything, you know, with respect to health and safety training, fire watch, right? Um, hazard awareness, accident investigation. If the company paid for it, they record that for the month, right? And uh, likewise, if you look at the heading here too on the slide, they also record what happens bad for the month, like how many accidents they had, how many property damage, how many illnesses, how many days away from work. And um, when I say record, for those who know what I'm talking about, it's recorded in a sheet of paper, it's like a spreadsheet. And then that is presented like to your managers at the end of the month so that they can see what has happened for the month. For example, how many inspections we did as compared to how many accidents we had, right? Now, this has another name that I was saying now, the other name we use for it in Trinidad is K as in kangaroo, P, I guess as in possum, I, right? So KPIs is what we call it in Trinidad. I as in ice, I guess, right? Um, Can I have KPIs. a question, please? Yes, go ahead. Is this the same thing as leading and lagging indicators? Yes, it is the same thing. Yeah, it is the same thing, right? Okay, so Trinidad, all right. We would hardly ever use the word active and reactive. We would have in our companies, we'll have something called leading and the leading is going to take the place of the active and the, they call it leading, uh, L-E-A-D. I'm trying not to pull the marker because my cursor is already spinning and it keeps spinning anyway. But um, so I'll spell it for you, right? So leading as in L-E-A-D-I-N-G and reactive is also called lagging indicators, L -E -double G. I N G, right? And it's recorded on a spreadsheet. Normally the top part of the spreadsheet is meant for the for the good stuff or for the active indicators. And just after you record the active, you record the lagging indicators, right? So um, if my internet is better, next week I'll show you a sheet. But as simple as that, and is not, not gonna ask you to see a sheet or to produce a sheet. Um, the concept is that a company on a monthly basis, they monitor what is happening. And that is what this session is all about, right? So they monitor the good stuff and they also monitor the bad stuff in the company. And uh, they take the action, for example, if you had like um, a high number of accidents, the managers will use that then to like schedule training and, you know, come up with corrective actions, et cetera, right? So one of the questions they ask, if I can get my slide to go, is why do that? Why bother? I mean, this is a simple question. Though. I mean, so companies will want to know what's going on, right? So why measure performance? The answer is here, right? So, um, so performance is measured by a combination of reactive and active monitoring techniques or leading and lagging techniques. Reactive and active monitoring generates data about what's happening, right, in the company on a monthly basis. Um, effective performance measurements provide information on what is the level of performance and why is the company performing like that, right? So uh, let me just take a positive stance. So let's say um, they had zero accident, fine. They had zero property damage, zero near miss, well not near miss reports, that, that probably is never possible to get zero. But um, they had zero illnesses then, right? And they can look and they can see why they can see that they have had such a good safety robust system. Everybody is working together. Everybody's wearing PPE. Nobody is fighting the company down, right? So I, again, the opposite may be true that if companies are having accidents, 
people may be speeding when they forklift, they may not be wearing their PPE, they may be, there may be breaking safety rules then. So the, the true answer is here, this, these two bullet points here. Why measure performance? Because you get to see what your level of performance is like and why is it like that? And you want to know why it is like that because you can, you can probably put measures in place to fix it if it was not good then, right? Um, I kind of waiting for my cursor to spin out. It, it's still turning on my side here, right? I was thinking it, it may be sort of like an exam. I mean, sorry to use that analogy, but it could be like an exam then like, um, you know, like uh, those of us who have kids or you remember, well, I mean, you are doing a course anyway, right? But remember getting these um, weekly exams and then the report would go back to your parents or whatever have you. If it's, uh, that's how Zoom is done in school now anyway, right? The primary schools anyway. So if you know a child would have gotten um, 30 out of 30 in spelling, well, you see what the level of performance is and why the performance was like that. It may have been that for the week, the parents, um, you know, sat down with the child and revised the work together with them so that they got 30 out of 30. And again, the opposite is also true. If you know the child has gotten five out of 30, at least they know that they know the teachers know so that they can try to address what's going on. You know, um, I guess how Zoom is now in primary school, I guess in the homes and what support the child is getting. So the same thing could work for you like when you have done OBE questions for me, I think I have never really, I've never gotten one that was but that was bad then. Those who submitted the OBE reports or the OBE questions anyway, quite frankly, I said I could call these names here, but I don't want to because um, it, it would not reflect that the truth is a lot of you, like when you did the OBE questions, there was nothing wrong with it. You almost had perfect questions. In fact, I may have asked some of you all here to use your questions as a sample for students in other classes. And I will keep using those when you all have left us, I'll keep using, I really got some good work from you all, right? Um, so I'll keep using your, your assignments as a sample as where it should be because then the other classes don't give us work like that, right? So that is the idea though that, you, that, that uh, measuring performance, if it is an exam or on a monthly basis in a company, it tells you what is happening and then why is that the way it is anyway, right? So identify some health and safety objectives an organization may set, right? Now, I would not ask you all to do this. Again, it's on this slide. What I wanna tell you here, because I know we're pushing for time too. Um, on this syllabus, right, there are five active that you have to know. There are five active that you have to know. Now, the good news is in the five, I can tell you, or the five is just straight in your book looking at you, right? Now, I know you see more than five here because this is actually not active. This is reactive, right? But I want to start at active. I mean, your book actually went to active first, right? So the five active, it's in one line here, because, but because it's only five, I think it's all stated in one line, right? So if you want to, oh yeah, the five is right here. Well, you'll see four, but there's only five then on your syllabus. There's only five active examples then on your syllabus. We call them indicators, right? So let me just say them from right here and I'll, I'll add the other one, right? So the five of them is a survey. A survey is seen to be good then. Let me just do one explanation, right? And then you'll catch the rest, right? So a survey is like if you ask the workers, you know, like, um, are you all suffering from back pains and you know, is the chair comfortable and stuff? So the fact that you're doing that is something positive for the workers then. So surveys are positive, right? They have five positive examples. So you have surveys, you have tours. A tour is like taking a walk or an inspection or an impromptu inspection. Sampling is also positive if you take it upon yourself to do like a noise sample or like a water pollution sample or like air pollution, you get the EMA to come in. These things are seen to be positive, right? Inspections, of course, you should guess is also positive. Why is an inspection positive? It's because you can pick up then, you can pick up on, okay, like um, the machine is making noise. 
or the belts. These are the pulleys, I call them belts, but you can say belts too. The belt, B-L-T, the belt needs to change because it seemed to be a bit worn, but you can pick those things up in an inspection and that's why it's positive. So what's the fifth one? The fifth one I said it maybe before, which was an audit, right? The fifth is an audit. So if you wanna turn your page with me, just so that you'll see them, you'll see them on page five, of uh, page chapter four. I'm sure if you read through line by line, they will say all five in one uh, mouthful, but just to show you the headings there, um, the active monitoring examples are things like safety inspection, sampling, tours, and um, you, you turn there, what you will see, I know they went into reactive, but the reason for that is because what they did Audit is to the end, audit is the last thing in the chapter. So if you could, no, sorry. But audit is there, right? So I'm turning here, I'm not seeing it, but audit is the last one, right? So there are the five of them. Uh, audit is the last one to make up the fifth one, right? So let me not waste time looking for it. You can look for it for yourself. When you see it, you just kind of highlight it anyway. I'm pretty much sure it's right around there. Right, um, so let's go to the reactive. So in terms of reactive, let me explain. They sometimes ask you for more reactive indicators and that's why you see there's more. If you look at anywhere in your book, you have more examples of bad stuff happening then than, than, than good examples, right? So if you want to take it from my slide, I have a bunch here. You may be asked up to 10 reactive indicators. What is a reactive indicator? It's something that you is not good, but it happened in the company. So you want to record it for the month. And that's what you see I have here, right? So reactive, um, it have more than eight here. It have about 10 here. So reactive could include the number of accidents, number of first aid, number of lost time. Uh, maybe you can say here, poor hygiene monitoring. Um, the cost of accidents, all of these are things that are going to be like lagging indicators or things that you don't want. Number of RIDO events. Now RIDO is a law in England that covers like dangerous, I don't know if we covered this in chapter one, I think we may have done this a bit in the first first lesson, right? That um, RIDO is a law that covers, the, the letters of RIDO stands for reportable Injuries, if you want to write it down. Trying to see if you can find it. You can find it on page 12. It's in bold and fuck on page 12, right? But I'll, I'll keep I'll keep saying it if you're writing it. So the R is reporting injuries. The other D there is uh diseases. If those things happen in your company, you have to report it. The second D is dangerous occurrences. And um, the, the last R is just the R for the regulation. What I'm just saying is that if you have any serious injuries, diseases, or dangerous occurrences, you have to record it as well, right? So um, number of claims for negligence, all of these things are negative on your company then, right? So this one doesn't belong here. This is the positive one. Number of enforcement actions. If you have a high number of it, it's reactive from OSHA number of complaints from workers about maybe working standards, poor standards of housekeeping, maybe you got negative results of the health surveillances that you did, and the a high number of absence and sickness records. Please make those little changes to what I'm saying there. Um, what will make these things negative then is that you have to kind of give it a negative spin. You have to say like for enforcement action, a high number of enforcement action. Because if you say a low number of enforcement action, it will be seen to be something that's positive. If they ask you for 10 reactive indicators, you have to give it a negative spin. So you have to say a high number of enforcement action, a high number of complaints about standards, a high, sorry, a poor standard of housekeeping, poor results from health surveillance um, findings, and uh, what is this one? Um, a high number of absence and sickness records, right? I am going to have to stop it based on the time as I have another 
plus to get two, right? So let me just stop the recording there. Um, of course, you know the next question is, do you have any questions for me? Um, okay, good, right? Um, please, again, let me just um, say that you